Okay, today we begin a series. We're calling it Divine Design. It's all about examining how God designed the world to work. And it really revolves around a pretty simple idea. Things operate best when they operate according to their design. That's pretty simple. In fact, if you violate something's design, at very best, you'll get less than optimal results. But if you violate something's design, at worst, you could get tragic results. Uh, let me give you, I saw a picture of this yesterday. Uh, college football started yesterday. Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, did y'all see that? Went to Tallahassee and took care of business. Georgia Tech's undefeated. We, we don't get to say that often after the season starts. Run to video. Anyway, I, I, uh, I digress. So I was watching the game, and all of these football player, players took the field. Now, here's something you can know about every single football player on the field. They are all very, very good at what they do. If they were not very, very good at what they do, they wouldn't be out there at the college Division I level. So uh, every player knows exactly what they're doing in their position. But here's what you'll notice. When the offense takes the field, before they snap the ball, somebody sends in a play. Now, what's a play? A play is a designed plan that describes what every person on the team is to do immediately after the ball is snapped. Uh, now, the objective of every play is exactly the same. The objective of a play is to move the ball forward, to move the ball down the field. And if everyone on the team does what he's supposed to do when the ball is snapped, according to the play, the ball will move forward down the field. All right, let's say for example, one of these stellar athletes who is more than capable of doing a great job, what if he decides after the play is called, he lines up in his position and he decides that he has a better idea. He decides to do what's right in his own eyes rather than doing what the play calls for. Okay, if one of the players does his own thing, chances are very high the play is going to fail. And when it fails, no one's going to be surprised that it fell. Now, why? Why is that? Because things operate best when they operate according to their design. Now, I want to make a statement. And in a world where universal agreement is almost impossible, I think there'll be universal agreement around this statement. You ready? Things are not working in the world as it should. Our world is simply not working as it should. In other words, things are not as they should be. I don't care who you are. I don't know anyone who would disagree with that statement. People should not try to hurt each other as they often do. People should not hate each other as they often do. Families should not be broken apart as they often are. Children should not be neglected or even abused as they often are. On and on we could go. The world is simply not operating as it should. And here's what I want to suggest. I want to suggest that the primary reason the world isn't working as it should is because we're violating the design. God, the creator, has designed the world to operate in a certain way. And when we violate that design, at best we get less than optimal results and at worst we get tragic results. Now here's the good news. We don't have a cruel creator. The creator's not cruel. In other words, God didn't say, okay, I'm gonna just throw some human beings on the planet earth and say, good luck with that. Hope you figure out something that works well. No, that's not the way God operates at all. God has given us a design. God has called a play. And if you and I operate according to design, life can be as it 
should be as it was designed to be. So over the next several weeks, here's, let me just kind of give you a path of where we're going. We're going to remind ourselves of God's design in several areas. We're going to look at how God designed marriage, for example. What, what is the recipe for a marriage that works? We'll look to God's design. We're going to look at God's design for family. How can families thrive? We'll look at the design. God created all of that. We're going to look at government. You know, God created government. What is God's design for government? What's God's design for the church? All of these things that God created, we're going to remind ourselves of how God designed them to work. But we're going to start this morning by talking about you. What does it mean to be human? How did God design you specifically as a human being? What is it that we need to know from God's play about how to live our lives as humans well? Well, we're going to start in chapter one. Chapter one of what? Chapter one of the Bible. So go all the way back to the very beginning of your first page, probably if your print's small enough. First page of your Bible. I want to read to you two verses out of Genesis chapter one. We're going to read several verses. We're going to start here. Genesis chapter one, beginning in verse 26. Listen, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses is describing how the creation event took place. And here's what he says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, question. How did God design you? Answer, you were created in God's image. You as a human being were created in God's image. Now, what does that mean? That obviously does not mean that we're divine like God is. It obviously does not mean that we have all knowledge like God does. It doesn't mean that we're all powerful like God is. So what does it mean to say that you are created in God's image? There's a verse just a few chapters over in Genesis that I think helps to clarify this. Uh, Moses is describing how Adam and Eve later had a son named Seth. And listen to what he says about that event. Genesis chapter five, verse three. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a serious lapse of judgment. (laughs) 130 years. He had a son in his own likeness. 130 years old, he had a son, watch those words, in his own likeness, in his own image. And he named him Seth. Okay, now we can get our heads around that. Because you and I know what it means when a son bears the image of his father. This does not mean that Seth was identical to Adam. It means that Seth resembled Adam in many ways. When people saw Seth, they were reminded of Adam. We we can get our heads around that. So when the Bible says you were created in God's image... And in God's likeness, that means you resemble God in ways that are unique. Something very important to to see in Genesis chapter 1. When God is creating the world, there are certain words that Moses uses, uh, that the Holy Spirit moves Moses to use. For example, when God created the plants, he created plants according to their own kind. When God created animals, he created animals according to their own kind. 
But when he created humans, he created humans in his own likeness and in his own image. That means that you and I bear the image of God in ways that make us very special and very unique in all of creation. So how is it that we differ from animals, for example, uh, because we bear God's image? Well, many ways. For example, as a human being, you have the ability to appreciate art and beauty. Animals don't have that ability. Humans have the ability to think logically and rationally. They don't always do it, but they have the ability to think logically and rationally. Animals can't do that. But I want to I spend a few minutes talking about one way that you and I as human beings are uniquely designed to be God's image bearers. And it's this. As humans, you are self-conscious and able to make ethical choices. In other words, as an image bearer of God, as a human being, you have the capacity to decide to do something just because it's right. Okay? Now, animals can't do that. When an animal makes a decision, an animal operates out of instincts. In other words, they try to, uh, they operate out of fear of punishment or hope of reward. They follow, animals are programmed to follow their instincts. Humans are different. Humans can actually override their instincts by making moral and ethical judgments. Let me give you an example. Uh, well, let me, let me say this first. What I, life does not work as it should when you allow instincts to excuse behavior. That's where I'm going with this. If you want to see life break down, try to violate God's design for you and allow instincts to excuse whatever inappropriate behavior you might be engaged in. Here's the example. I was speaking to a man a while back and uh, he had had an inappropriate relationship with a lady who was not his wife. And he had been found out. By the way, you always get found out. Uh, he had been found out, and I was talking to him. And in the course of the conversation, he said something like this. Look, I'm only human. Okay, I looked at him and said, no, you're not only human. Animals act on their instincts with no ethical or moral judgment. That's what animals do. You, on the other hand, are a human who is able, you have the capacity to override your instincts, override your impulses, override your desires to make ethical and moral decisions. Millard Erickson says it this way. I love this. He says, we cannot excuse our improper behavior by blaming instincts and drives. Our being as, is at a higher level, which sets us apart from the rest of creation. All right. The reason I wanted to park on this is because it explains so much of what we see. For example, the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution is rooted in this idea right here. Here's what the sexual revolution, sexual revolution, by the way, that seems to be rampant all over the globe normalizing every kind of perversion you can think of. Netflix just jumped on the bandwagon to normalize child pornography and pedophilia. If you, look, I used to have Netflix. I don't have Netflix anymore. Because <laughs> I, why? I don't want my money supporting child porn. That's why. So, I mean, if you, if, if you still have Netflix, uh, just go to Profile account, <laughs> cancel membership. It's real simple. Took me about 30 seconds. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Um, the sexual revolution is based on this idea that says this, look, if I have instincts or impulses that point in a certain direction, I should be true to myself. 
and I should follow wherever those instincts and impulses might lead. Okay, that's precisely what animals do. That is not what humans have to do. Why? Because humans have the capacity as God's image bearers to make moral and ethical judgments that override our impulses and instincts. So one of the, one of the ways that you and I were designed, we were designed as God's image bearers, meaning that we are self-conscious and we're able to make ethical decisions. Here's something else about the way that God designed you. You're priceless. Well, Pastor Jeff, you don't know me. That's okay. You're priceless. Not because of what you've done, not because of what you've accomplished, not because of what you have. You are of infinite value because God created you to be his image bearer. Uh, now I want to make a statement here. This is very important. Your worth, your value was nailed down the moment you were conceived. When 23 chromosomes from your mother united with 23 chromosomes from your father and a brand new person came to be, a brand new person created in God's image your value became locked in at that moment. You don't have to do anything to add to that value. There's nothing you can do that takes away from that value. Your value was locked in the moment you were conceived. David said it this way, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You are valuable. You are priceless. Not because of anything other than the fact that you were created in God's image. Here's a story to illustrate this. Several years ago, I was in Washington and I was uh, uh, touring a museum. It was not one of the Smithsonian's. It was another museum. And I walked into this room that was very interesting because there were all of these old books and manuscripts just laying out on tables that you could actually flip through. I'd never been in a museum like that where you could handle the stuff. So I spent some time, you know, flipping through some really old books. I can't remember what they were, but uh, they, it was very, very interesting. But I noticed in the middle of the room, there was a single case. And inside that case was a document. Now, the reason that caught my attention was because it was the only document in the entire room that was protected. So naturally, your attention's drawn to it. I walked over and looked down into this glass case, and inside was a old piece of paper, a single sheet of paper, not a book. It did not look as impressive as some of the other manuscripts that were laying out. In fact, the writing on this piece of paper was barely legible. So I'm wondering to myself, why is this in a case when nothing else is? And then I looked down at the bottom of the piece of paper and found that it was a letter signed by George Washington. Okay, what made that piece of paper more valuable than anything else in the room? Not how it looked, not what it contained, but because of who signed it. It bore George Washington's signature. Do you know, what, you know why you're priceless? Because you bear the Creator's signature. God created you in His image. Now here's where I, what I want you to see. Life can break down when we violate that design. For example, life doesn't work as it should when culture determines your value. When your value becomes extrinsically determined rather than intrinsically determined, life begins, life and culture begins to break down. For example, let's suppose you're a biological accident and you are nothing more, you are nothing more than a, 
a product of an evolutionary process over a long period of time. You're just a collection of cells that happen to form a human being. That's who you are. Okay, if that's true, there is nothing that gives you intrinsic value like being created in God's image does. There's nothing that gives you intrinsic value. So if there's nothing intrinsically that defines your value, then your worth must be determined extrinsically, must be determined by culture. Somebody on the outside has to ascribe value to you if it's not intrinsic. And when that happens, life and culture breaks down. Let me give you some examples. Let's suppose culture tries to assign you value based on how you look. Okay? Let's say, let's say that your value is culturally determined by your appearance. That leads to cultural breakdowns. That leads to shaming people for their appearance. That leads to racism and slavery and bigotry and all sorts of things. Just because somebody looks different, I look at their value differently. Here's another way that culture breaks down when your value is extrinsically determined. If your value is based on how productive you are, that leads to cultural breakdowns. If, if you're more valuable if you produce more or contribute more, and you're less valuable if you contribute less, then think about where that leads. That leads to abortion. A baby cannot contribute to society. It brings nothing to the table. So it's worthless. Baby, the little baby's worthless. On the other hand, if there's someone who is not able, they're too feeble to contribute to society any longer, all of a sudden that person also becomes worthless because value is assigned extrinsically based on what they're able to contribute. That leads to cultural breakdown. If value is based on how much you have, that leads to cultural breakdowns where societies are characterized by this insatiable desire for money and more and class warfare and all the rest. So what I'm getting at is this, whoever you are, it does not matter what you look like. It does not matter how much you have. It doesn't matter what you do or have done or will do. Your value is determined by the fact that you are created in God's image. You are priceless. Also, as an image bearer of the creator, you have a God-given purpose. Everything God does is purposeful. God does not do something just to be doing something. God created you for a purpose. Now, what is your purpose as a human being? Why did God create you as his image bearer? Here it is, Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. At the end of the day, you are ultimately here to bring glory to God, to make a big deal out of him. That's why Paul would say later, whatever, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Of God, because the reason you and I are here is to bring honor and glory to Him, to make a big deal out of God. Now, here's where life can break down. Here's where we can violate God's design. Life does not work as it should when it's all about you. In other words, if your life is about bringing yourself glory, as opposed to bringing God glory. That is a misuse of life. That is not operating according to God's design. When your decisions are what's best for me, rather than what's best for God and his purposes, 
Life begins to break down. Let me share with you another story that illustrates how this works. I don't think this is true. You may have heard this before. But it's the story about uh, a young college student who was starting his freshman year at a university out of state. And his parents uh, drove him to his dorm, moved him in, uh, kissed him by, and then drove back home out of state. Well, after about three weeks into the first semester, this young college freshman had burned through all the money his parents had left him. He had a really good time for three weeks. <laughs> uh, then he realized he was in trouble because he had most of the semester ahead of him and he was out of money. So here's what he did. He sent his dad a text. Dad, can you please send me some more money? I've run out. And his dad promptly replied, uh, I will send you exactly what you need. Okay, so the boy was relieved to get that note from his dad. So a couple days passed, and he was excited when a package showed up at his dorm uh, hall. So he got the package, took it into his room, tore the package open, and inside the package was a Bible. And on the outside of the Bible, there was a post-it note that said, Son, this is all you need. Okay, so the little boy couldn't believe his father had ignored his request for money. And he made him angry. So he threw open the drawer of his desk, threw the Bible in, slammed it shut, and then tried to figure out what am I going to do for the rest of the semester. So he got several jobs, ate crackers, drunk a lot of water, you know, and didn't have, didn't go out with friends when they were going out. Really struggled to make it that semester. Well, at the end of the semester, his parents came to pick him up, take him home for the holidays. And as soon as his parents walked into his dorm room, they knew something was wrong. I mean, he was angry. He was withdrawn. So his dad said, son, what's, what's the matter? Well, all of this pent up anger just came spilling out. Dad, I cannot believe you would not send me the money I need to at least eat this entire semester. I have struggled to make ends meet. He just went on and on and on and on. And his father said, son, did you read the Bible I sent you? And the son said, Dad, with all due respect, what I needed was not the Bible. What I needed was money. And the dad said, give me the Bible. So the son reached into the drawer, pulled the Bible out, handed it to his dad. His dad opened the Bible and interlaced within its pages were $100 bills. <laughs> you see, the son had everything he needed all the time but he would only find it when he went to God. Matthew chapter uh, six, verses 31 through 33 says this. So do, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Listen very closely. If you pursue after yourself, hoping to find God, you will find neither. But if you pursue after God, you will find both. When you make it your life's purpose to align with your design and seek God's glory first, all of the sudden, all of the sudden, life makes sense. All of the sudden, life is full. And you have the desires of your, your deepest needs are met. So, you, are, uh, you have a God-given purpose to bring glory to God. Let me close with this. Part of God's design for you. You were made to thrive in a right relationship with God. God did not create you to live apart from him. God created you to have a right relationship with him. Jesus alluded to this. The thief comes only to steal and to destroy, to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have a life and have it to the full. 
See, God's plan, God's design for you is abundance in all that that means. But when we try to live life apart from God, we never fully attain all that God expects, our, anticipates, and wants our life to be. Uh, A.W. Tozer uses this example. Uh, in my house are many different appliances. I, uh, and they're amazing. They each do something different, but they're all very good at what they do. Uh, there's one appliance I have. You can open the door. You can put dirty dishes in it, close it up, hit a button, and clean dishes come out. I mean, it does a great job. <laughs> Saves me a lot of time and effort. There's another one I, I do, does the same with clothes. You put dirty clothes in, you hit a button, and clean clothes come out. I got another appliance that keeps food cool. And yet I have another appliance that heats food up. All these different appliances do different things, but they all do these different things very, very well, as long as they're plugged in. You see, it doesn't matter what an appliance can do. If it's not plugged into a power source, it is no good. It's worthless. It never achieves its potential. But when you plug it into a power source, it can be and it can do all that it was created and designed to be and do. One of the most tragic things, one of the most tragic things is to see people trying to live life unplugged from the power source. They have so much potential. Life can be so much better than it is if they would only get connected to the power source. Life doesn't work as it should. When we try to live apart from God, you were created to thrive in a right relationship with God. Pastor Jeff, what does that look like? How can I have a right relationship with God? Well, to have a right relationship with a perfect, holy God, you and I have to deal with a very serious problem called sin. Because with sin in our lives, we can never have a relationship with a perfect and holy God. We can never plug into that power source. Our sin prevents it. So here's what God did. God sent Jesus, his son, into this world to die on a cross, bearing your sins and mine, to pay the penalty that you and I owe. And the Bible teaches that whoever places their faith in Jesus and what he did for them when he paid for their sin, God will supernaturally and miraculously wipe sin away. Your sin becomes literally as if it never happened. And that makes it possible for you to connect with the creator. I wonder as I close have you ever placed your faith in Jesus? Are you trying to live life apart from the ultimate power source? The wonderful news is God makes a relationship with him available to every single person who will call on his son, Jesus Christ. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. If you would like to place your faith in Jesus, connecting to the ultimate power source, I want to invite you to pray a prayer in your heart silently. It might sound something like this. Dear God, I admit I've sinned. I've blown it. And I'm in desperate need of forgiveness. I believe Jesus died in my place to pay for my sin. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And right now, I place all my trust in what Jesus did for me to rescue me from my sin, making a relationship with you possible. Receive me into your family as I receive Jesus into my life as my Savior and as my Lord. In his name I pray, amen. Okay, everyone looking this way, if that was your prayer, if you made that prayer your own this morning, I would like to ask you to do something that I think will be helpful to you. As you leave, uh, over to the left-hand side of our grand foyer is a guest services counter. 
uh, at that counter, we have prepared a packet of information uh, just for you that explains what it means to place your faith in Jesus, what it means to uh, be a Christian. Uh, we would love to be able to give that to you as you leave, so please stop by guest services on your way out. Now, if you're watching online, we would love to mail this to you. And the only way we can do that is to receive your mailing address from you. So you can provide that to us in one of several ways. If you're watching on our website, firstredeemer.org, just above the video that you're watching is a link that will take you to a form that allows you to send us your mailing address. If you're watching on Facebook Live, that form is on a link in the comment section. And then if you're watching on our mobile app, it's over on the home page. So please take just a moment. Send us your mailing address. Look, we promise not to do anything with your mailing address other than send you this information. We think it'll be a blessing to you.